All right. Um, over on Canvas, then I got a couple of things going on today. We're going to do a little bit of a callback to the Bob and Jane problem. Okay. Bob and Jane problem dealt with this type of setup where you've got a couple of bodies connected by a string. Uh, it's running over a pulley. And so hijinks ensue. Just got to it here. There we go. Yeah, it's all right. Uh, there we go. A little something like that. All right. Um, so if you would, be a deer and pull this up. This is on canvas. It's kind of hard to see from a distance. Sorry. And what I'm asking you to do on the Pear Deck is a little bit of a ranking task. Rank the accelerations. So again, what's happening in situation one, um, you've got Bob and Jane hanging together. I guess I can draw this on the thing. So situation one, Bob and Jane are up at roof level and you got a crate and nails down at the ground. Okay, so Bob and Jane are gonna go down, crate and nails are gonna go up. Situation two, uh, Bob is going to let go. So now it's just Jane hanging onto the rope, crate and nails on the other end. Situation three, uh, Jane's up at the top, and the crate bursts, and so the nails go away. And then situation four, um, so let's see. So here Jane would have gone down, crate would have gone up. So now finally Jane goes away. Let's go the rope, and it's the crate coming down on its own. Something like that. So take a look on here, see if you can find the accelerations or you have your own shoot somewhere. But take a look at how the accelerations rank out. And then I need you to kind of think about the rhyme or reason to it. Like rank them from greatest to least. What is the key to a big acceleration? What is the key to the least acceleration? And can you kind of think about a range of values too? What is like, what's the least acceleration you would expect to find? What is the most acceleration you would expect to find? Okay. If you could be a deer and use greater than or equal symbols, that'd be super cool. These things. Again, the other thing I'm asking you to consider in addition to your ranking is sort of the continuum of reasonable values. Like what is the least acceleration 
you could expect to find in such a device, what is the most acceleration? Is there an upper end to the acceleration? Yeah. What's the least acceleration you expect in such a device? Is there a minimal amount? Is there a maximum amount? That's kind of what I'm asking. Okay. Okay. Still waiting on a few of you. At least give us the ranking, if you would. There's not like an ABCD, so it's like one, two, three, four. Which one is the greatest acceleration, which is the least? Interesting. All right. Let's take a look at what our friends are thinking here. Um, looks pretty universal. Everybody can read. That's good. So four has got the greatest acceleration. Uh, two has the least. In between there, you've got three and you've got one. Um, so we've got some people noticing some patterns. It seems like the higher the difference of the two masses, the higher the acceleration. Um, small mass, large unbalanced force, big acceleration. Large mass, small unbalanced force, small acceleration. Um, as far as a range of values, ooh, a lot of deleted responses here. That's the Mueller probe having its effect. Um, Some people are supposing different values here. Maybe two would be the smallest acceleration. That's certainly the smallest acceleration on the sheet. Um, the most, 10. Again, that's the most on the sheet. Um, how do I get an acceleration at zero? What has to be the situation here? Balance forces, right? So if I have 250 grams on this side and I have 250 grams on this side, if I give it a push, Right, it just kind of coasts, kind of a little CV-ish there. Okay, so acceleration of zero if the force is balanced. But if I have differing amounts of mass, if I have 250 on the heavy side and 50 on the light side, I'm going to get some kind of a non-zero acceleration. The forces aren't balanced. Okay. If instead of 50 on the low side, oh, that happened. If I, instead of having 50 grams on the low side, if I have zero, 
forces are unbounded, so it's going to be some acceleration. Okay. Or if I go the other direction, if I have 50 on the heavy side, okay. and I got nothing on the other side, I to get some acceleration happening there. So that's kind of the continuum I'm talking about. You get an acceleration of zero. Oh, sad. It's out of ink. You get an acceleration of zero if we've got VFPM. But if we don't, if I've got that 50 gram hanger on there, then I'm just going to have FG. That's going to be like point. Five newtons, right? Because uh, 100 grams is one newton, so half of that would be half of that. Uh, tension is zero. So I'm going to get some acceleration here, okay? Call that A1. How does the acceleration compare for the 250 grams? 250 grams. Now I'm going to have... Fg of 2.5 newtons. Ft is still zero up here. How does acceleration in situation one compare to acceleration in system two? So let me ask you a new short text response question there. What do you think? How are those accelerations going to compare? And I just wanted to get a quick snapshot here of answers. Let me just show you a little sampling of what folks are putting in. Uh, I've got a vote for acceleration of object one being less than acceleration of object two. Uh, similar answer, A1 smaller and A2 greater because of a larger UF. Uh, somebody thinking they're the same because the ratio to FU to mass would be the same. Um, somebody, oh, that changed. There was somebody that thought A1 was greater than A2, but that's changed. So I guess we're looking at two answers, really. Uh, that A2 is the greatest or that they would be the same. Okay? Mold that with your neighbors really quick. What are you thinking? Powering on. We're dealing with a particular type of situation here where the only force acting on the object is gravitational force. Okay? Um, and I didn't want to leave that unexplored here. We just kind of brushed past that the other day, and I, I was thinking about it over break. I wanted us to go back and, and put a little more thought into that here in the unbalanced force particle model. So I've got a couple of videos to share with you here. Um, hopefully shed a little light on this idea. And I remember the speaker thing. Say so. Jack holds both balls above his Sorry, head. Sorry, it's really loud And he drops them at exactly the same time. What do you expect to see? Well, they're going to hit the ground at the same time. I expect them to both land at the same time. The same time. At the same time. Well, I think they both will. This one to hit the ground first. However, they will actually both hit the ground at the same time. Yeah. Where's that? Science. Because, yeah, science. <laughs> <laughs> now, the black one clearly feels a lot heavier. So the standard misconception is to believe that 
the black ball will accelerate at a greater rate and reach the ground first. This year, many people had an idea that both balls would land at the same time, but they didn't know exactly why. I found there were some different misconceptions. For example, many people seem to think that as an object falls towards the Earth, it falls with a constant speed. From this height, yeah, pretty much. Just constant speed all the way down speed. Yeah, I think it would be the same constant speed. I think it's constant. I, I, I seem to remember it being constant. I did decently in physics, and I seem to remember that's the answer. Whereas the truth is, the speed of both balls is changing all the time. The balls are speeding up as they go towards the ground. That's what the force of gravity does on them. It makes them accelerate. It gets them to speed up. Another misconception I discovered was that some people believe both balls should have the same gravitational force on them, even though the black ball is clearly much, much heavier. The reason I think they said this was because they knew both balls needed to reach the ground at the same time, so they reasoned that the force on them must be the same. Tell me about how the gravitational force on this ball compares to the gravitational force on that ball. The force is the same. It's going to be very similar in terms of gravitational force. They both have the same, and they'll fall at the same rate. I'm not like Einstein, but same gravitational force around the whole world, right? Because the gravitational yeah, the pull on the Earth is the same on both objects. Are you saying that the force on them is the same? The pull is the same. But you felt the pull and you've told me the pull is different. No, I said the weight is different. I didn't say the pull is different. It is heavier. And has more gravitational pull. But when I drop them, then they get equal with gravitational pull somehow. Don't you think it's going to be like five times as much? Yeah, you think, but it's not. The way you're asking it, yes, but scientifically speaking, no. The gravitational force on both these balls are the same. Okay. The gravitational force on both of these balls is the same. Is that what you actually believe? No, but it what is. You, tell, me, tell me what you believe. I believe it should be more on this, simply for the fact that this is heavier. I just, intuition tells me that it should be more, but after learning physics, we learn that it is actually the same. <laughs> I actually think the force on this ball is more than no, the force on this ball. No, you don't. I, I swear, <laughs> I am not trying to mess with you. <laughs> So, like in, in real life? In real life and in physics. I will tell you that the force on this ball is more. All right, ready? Three, two, one. Yeah. Yep, see? Same time. Whatever, Jesus. Same time. I would say the force on the medicine ball is like a lot more. Okay, right? But that's not the whole story. So that's why we've got to keep in mind the two things that are going to impact the acceleration. The force, certainly, but also the mass of the object. So if we go in and we look at these two here, uh, grab a different color. So the only force acting is gravitational force. That means that my Fu here is going to be the same as my gravitational force. So I've got an Fu of 0.5 newtons. So this acceleration is going to be 0.5 newtons divided by the mass of this thing, 50 grams in kilograms. Hey, Siri, what is 50 grams in kilograms? All right. 0.05 kg. Who's got a calculator handy? 0.5 divided by 0.05. Ten. Okay, cool. Somebody had a calculator over there somewhere. Ten newtons. Per kilogram, aka again, keep in mind newtons. The unit newton is a kilogram meter per second squared. Okay, so if I'm taking newtons over kilograms, that's like taking kilogram meter per second squared. Hey, what is going on here? Doesn't like when my fat hand is touching the screen. Come on. All right. So, dimensionally, that's what's happening. I cancel out the kilograms and I get left with meters per second squared. So, this 10, I could write that as 10 meters per second squared. Same thing. Okay. Uh, this guy, 250 grams. Again, my FU is going to be the same. Same. The Fu is going to be the same as gravitational force. So when I go to calculate this acceleration, I've got 
Fu, 2.5 newtons. And I'm dividing by, by the mass, 250 grams, so that's going to be 0 0.25, 0 0.25. Sorry, I got distracted by the people that are distracted over there. 2.5 newtons divided by 0.25 kilograms. Who's got a calculator? Hey, what do you know? 10 newtons per kilogram, which again, that's 10 meters per second squared. So that's going to serve as the upper bound for this thing. Whether I put 250 grams here and I drop it, or I put 450 grams here and I drop it, or I put like a kilogram here and I drop it, or whatever I put there and I drop it, we're going to have this constant ratio. Because if you think about it, when I'm determining the – oh, where did I put the pen? Um, uh, to determine the gravitational force, I'm always taking that mass, right? Gravitational force. So that's going to be the mass times 10 newtons per kilogram. And that's equal to the FU when gravity is the only force acting on it. So the FU and what is called free fall. Free fall is just a fancy way of saying... There's no other forces acting on it besides gravity. So I've got M times 10 newtons per kilogram. And then again, if you look at this, I'm taking the unbalanced force and I'm dividing it by the mass. So divided by mass, mass cancels out, and I get 10 newtons per kilogram, a.k.a. 10 meters per second squared in free fall. So there's a special letter assigned to this thing. The 10 newtons per kilogram or 10 meters per second squared. That is the gravitational field strength. At the Earth's surface. But again, that's a lot to write, yeah? So we just call it lowercase g. And I make mention of that because one of the mastering problems talks about solving symbolically. Uh, which is something you'll do a fair bit. And so when you're doing that, like when College Board will ask you to do that, they'll say derive an expression in terms of these variables and fundamental constants. And it's kind of dumb because this is not a fundamental constant. This is a value for a field strength near the Earth's surface. You go away from the surface. It's not constant in chain. Okay? Uh, but they'll expect you to leave G as a, a variable in your equation. So then if you took it to the moon, it would still work. G at the moon surface. Okay? Um... Let's check out then this whole idea with our dear friend Brian Cox here. I should have showed you this before I showed you the math, but this is too good not to show you. This is NASA's Space Power Facility in Cleveland, Ohio, and it is the world's biggest vacuum chamber. It's used to test spacecraft in the conditions of outer space, and it does that by pumping out the 30 tons of air in this chamber until there are about two grams left. And it's kind of got an eccentric construction, which is part of its history. It was built in the 1960s as a nuclear test facility to test nuclear propulsion systems. And that meant that they built it out of aluminium to make the radiation easier to deal with. Aluminium is not the best thing, the strongest material to build a vacuum chamber out of. So, they built an outer concrete skin, which is part radiation shielding and part an external pressure vessel, so that this thing can take the force that's present on the outside when it's pumped out to the conditions of outer space. Galileo's experiment was simple. He took a heavy object and a light one and drop them at the same time to see which fell fastest. So it spared no expense in creating this video for you to show you that feathers now In this case, the feathers fell, the fell to the ground at a slower rate than the bowling ball because of air resistance.
So in order to see the true nature of gravity, we have to remove the air. It takes three hours to pump out the 800,000 cubic feet of air from the chamber. We dropped two millitor in the last 30 minutes. But once it's complete, there's a near perfect vacuum inside. 6104 manual, 10% open. Station one, go for drop. PCB 30-1, pressure set point at 240 PSI. We are go for drop. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, Amazon, two, one, release. So made this really fancy video, but then they never bother showing it to you in real time at any point in this clip. So, like, based on feedback I got a few years ago, I, I determined that people thought, like, it would just gracefully, slowly fall towards Come on, NASA and the BBC. But again, the idea they're trying to convey to you here is that those things will fall together, slow motion, in real time. <laughs> look at that. They came down exactly the same. Those are all NASA engineers. They're not really that orientation. With that actors. Exactly. Exactly the same. That is called move nothing. I think that's that's quite a lot of effort to go to to make a, a video of a feather falling at the same time as a heavy object. Uh, but in our history, we've we've wasted even more money to do this so let's go moon feather hammer everybody's favorite alternative to rock paper scissors is moon feather hammer based on one of the wood steakhouse cuts it. 12 ounce new york strip center cut Man, for a short for schedule. time 14 ounce delmonico the feeling the flavor the place walmart steakhouse you can't say we don't even fake. have one of those uh, Jim, we copied a Bosch Overwind and uh, Tennessee uh, Drum go. in the ETB. Not quite yet. I haven't put the solar wind in yet, but I will shortly. I want to watch this. Okay. I have a, a good picture there. I've got the... Beautiful picture, Dave. This is before 4K, sorry. Well, in my left hand, I have a, a feather. In my right hand, a hammer. And I guess one of the reasons uh, we got here today was because of a gentleman named Galileo a long time ago who made a rather significant discovery about falling objects in gravity fields. And we thought that uh, where would be a better place to confirm his uh, findings than on the moon. And uh, so we thought we'd try it here for you. Uh, the feather happens to be appropriately a falcon feather for our falcon. And I'll uh, drop the two of them here and hopefully... They'll hit the ground at the same time. How about that? Uh, that proves that Mr. Galileo was correct in his findings. There you go, man. You can't fake that. All right. So that is the size of the kids. <laughs>